these are a relatively rare form of blood cancer, and they start in the stem cell, um, which is the origin of all the blood cells in the body. Now, we're not talking about the stem cells you hear about on the news. They can't become an earlobe or a tooth. But these stem cells reside in the bone marrow. You're born with them, and over the course of your entire life, they produce all of your blood cells, all your red blood cells to carry oxygen, your white blood cells that make up your immune system and your platelets that keep your blood from clotting too frequently and bleeding too frequently. So myeloproliferative neoplasms are a cancer that occur inside, well, they start in the instructions inside that cell and disrupt the normal choreography of blood creation. Sometimes they result in too many platelets, sometimes too many red blood cells, sometimes an over-proliferation of all cells and a creation of uh, uh, scar tissue inside the marrow called fibrosis. They're not a very common cancer, but they, so, and they're can very, I would say, heterogeneous, meaning some versions are some, are diseases that people can live with, with minimal symptoms much of their life, and some can be quite aggressive. They're usually categorized in the, by three, three names, essential thrombocythemia, polycythemia vera, and primary myelofibrosis. They have a tendency, not all of them, but some of them have a tendency to become more aggressive over time, and in rare cases can convert into acute leukemia as well. When we first learned how to diagnose um, these conditions, we looked at the cells underneath a microscope, and we looked at something called chromosomes. Chromosomes were um, the first way we could characterize what blood cancers, how blood cancers might be categorized one versus another. But since 2005, well, actually throughout the 80s and 90s, we learned more and more about how the instructions inside these myeloproliferative cancer cells might be different than the instructions inside normal cells. That's the genomic changes, things that you can't see with your naked eye, but you might be able to determine by sequencing or other um, laboratory techniques. Well, what we've learned is, as we've looked at more and more patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms, we've been able to characterize the behavior of these cells based on those genetic mutations. So the first discovery in polycythemia vera was that there was a mutation called the JAK2 mutation. It was then found to also be present in essential thrombocythemia and myelofibrosis. Well, after looking at large numbers of people with these conditions, we can say, for example, patients with JAK mutation, essential thrombocythemia, their disease is more aggressive than patients with essential thrombocytemia who don't have that. So this has allowed us to really predict how your disease might affect you based on those genomic mutations. I would say we're just beginning to scratch the surface, but the idea is eventually we can look into the future and say, here's your age, here's your other health issues, and here's the kind of genetics your disease has, and so we're gonna pick this kind of therapy for you. The first way we think of that is, is prognosis, and that means predicting how your disease will work. And we have information about given clinical outcomes that correspond with given mutations now in polycythemia vera, essential thrombocythemia, and myelofibrosis. We're not yet at the point, which I think is in the future, of a therapeutic choice based on those. For example, is it better to choose one strategy over another? One significant change has happened in the last year, though, and that's in patients with essential thrombocythemia. There's been a change in the guidelines about how we manage those patients, again, based now on genetics. We can say now that people with essential thrombocythemia who have the JAK mutation are at a higher risk for blood clots than people who don't. And so in those patients, now we recommend aspirin. And in patients who don't have those JAK mutations, we can now back off that aspirin and therefore maybe reduce the risk of bleeding. That judgment, that therapeutic decision-making based on genetics is moving forward. In primary myelofibrosis, I think the next um, obstacle as a community we need to overcome is understanding whether or not genetics should influence the decision about a stem cell transplant in patients with those diseases.
precision medicine, when I think about medical therapies, I think about precision as the way that we can take a very heterogeneous, a very disease that has a lot of different manifestations and then make the therapy for that individual patient appropriate for them. Ideally, by if their disease has the uh, indicators that it's going to become aggressive, then choosing more aggressive therapy. If it has an indicator that it's going to be less aggressive, more what we call indolent or chronic, choosing less aggressive therapy. So really being able to use a true, valid, reproducible prediction marker for their disease to choose the strongest or the least strong medicine for them and therefore avoiding toxicities of our therapies. Now none of this works unless we have good therapies to choose from. So just because we're understanding a little bit more about these mutations doesn't in any way abrogate the urgency for more novel, creative, uh, safe, and affordable treatments for patients. Because it's only when we have a lot of arrows in the quiver can we choose the right arrow for the right target. I always think, you know, there's three steps. The first is confirm the diagnosis. The second is what risk do I face from this diagnosis? And the third is choosing treatment. And I always go in those three steps. So one of the most important things for people to talk to their doctors is how sure are we are about my diagnosis. I think most people need a bone, marrow a bone marrow biopsy to confirm that diagnosis. If you haven't had one, really consider it with your doctor because the best way to really understand what's going on in the marrow is to look at it, at least at diagnosis. And then I always, you know, I, I definitely reassure people that nobody's going to be offended if you get a second opinion, right? The only person that matters in that room is you. And really, sureness and, and clarity about that diagnosis lays the foundation for good decision making for the rest of your treatment trajectory.